Universalist Fellowship of Pottstown. Whether you're seated a few feet from where I'm standing or miles away, whether it's December 5, where you are, or some other date, though presumably not earlier than December 5. We gather here this Sunday morning not because we share a creed, but because we share a promise to support one another on our spiritual journeys. Our services are different each week, but the love and compassion we offer one another here remains the same each week. So whoever you are, wherever you come from, whomever you love, we're glad to have you with us today. And as always, please stay for coffee and conversation after the service. This is the time for announcements. Does anyone have an announcement that's pertinent to the fellowship? Please come to the front, use the microphone, and remember, remember to introduce yourself. I'm Karen Muller, and I'm the other minister here. I am recruiting for Christmas Eve. Any child who would like a role in the Christmas Eve service at 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve is welcome to participate. I have the essential roles covered, but any additional role will work. What I'm looking for is a child with a stuffed animal who needs something from a tree. And I have a letter here that suggests some of the things that that might be. So if you, uh, Ruby, I gave one to Maddie, but I'll make sure you get a letter. And if any of the, anybody else has grandchildren coming for Christmas Eve and wants to participate, I can give you one of these as well. So thank you very much. Chalice. Who is the chalice later this morning? The chalice lit in our midst is a symbol of our liberal faith, faith built on the foundations of freedom, reason, and welcome. Faith sustained by acts of kindness and justice. Faith that envisions a world flourishing with no one left out. Faith that inspires the living out of goodness. Faith that requires thoughtfulness and compassion, a faith of wholeness and integrity. This tiny flame is a symbol, a spark of all this within each of us. Thank you, Alan. Wake up, dear friends, and look about you. If we don't marvel, if we don't marvel at the wonder of creation, if we don't savor the mystery of existence, if we don't justify the persistence of hope, who will? And what better time? Harley, our opening hymn, please. The Bible is a holy book, a sacred text. The 
The Bible is a relic from a past era. It belongs in the museum. The Bible is a source of wisdom and inspiration. The writers of the Bible seem obsessed with sex and violence. An overriding theme of the Bible is justice for the oppressed. Some of the rules in the Bible are just crazy, silly, or at least outdated. The Bible opens a window to the past. All the heroes in the Bible are flawed. Even God. Would a hero without flaws be credible? And now this is a time to remind you of the offering that this, this fellowship needs our financial support at all times. Are we actually collecting an offering or are we reminding people to put something in later? Freely have we received the gifts that minister to our needs of body and spirit. Gladly do we share a portion of this bounty. The offering will now be received. Oh, we are For all ages, a story, a dramatic story for the children, but for everybody. And would the acting company please come forward? This story is based on an event described in the Bible, two of the four Gospels. I've made some changes and moved it from 2,000 years ago to today. Dr. Josephson was known in Bethlehem, that's Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, for treating all the sick people who came to him for help, whether they could pay him or not. His, in essence, was a free clinic. He worked by himself with one assistant to help him. Not sure how he could afford to do this, but his wife had a job that paid well, and his father left him some money. One morning, a little after 10.30, a woman with a small child came to see him. Good doctor, I need your help. What is it? What is your problem? It's my daughter. She has a bad cough. She's been coughing almost constantly for three days now, and it's not getting any better. And I think she has a fever. I need your help. Can you help her? Doctor, she's not from Bethlehem, but from Lebanon. Lebanon, by the way, is a city in central Pennsylvania, a couple of hours southwest of Bethlehem. Madam, I'm here to help the good people of Bethlehem. To help someone from Lebanon, you'll be taking the children's food and throwing it to the dogs. Yes, doctor. Yet the dogs eat the food that falls on the kitchen floor or that ends up on the dining room table. Dr. Josephson heard her, and her response went to his heart. Let it be done as you wish. Here is a bottle of coffee. <laughs> Give your daughter two tablespoons of it twice a day. If she is not getting better by Wednesday, bring her back to see me. Oh, thank you, doctor. Thank you for your wise instruction. For we should help people in need wherever they come from, even if they're from Lebanon or Scranton. 
Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We are all made in God's image. The woman and her daughter left, taking the medicine with them. And by Wednesday, her daughter's cough was almost gone, and her temperature was almost back down to normal. Now, can someone tell me who in the Bible Dr. Josephson represents? Who is Joseph's son in the Bible, in the New Testament? Does anybody know the answer to that one? My friends. We need to write, who are the parents, the earthly parents of Jesus? Uh huh. So who would Josephson be? doctor here represents Jesus. <laughs> and you're probably wondering what people in Bethlehem have against people in Lebanon. Well, nothing, I made that up. But Lebanon sounded like a, a foreign place. In the area where Jesus lived 2,000 years ago, there were people of different nationalities or religions. There were conflicts among them. Do we have any conflicts today between people of different groups? Oh my goodness. <laughs> the woman in the story, the woman from Lebanon, is telling us that we should all get along together. We should all help each other. People 2,000 years ago needed to hear that message. And people still need to hear it today. They need to hear it and follow it. So thank you, Father, for bringing us that message. Thank you, Dr. Absorbing it and acting on it. And thank you all for helping. with the joy you could not wait to share with a sorrow weighing on your heart now is your opportunity to share it with the rest of us and if you wish please come forward to use the microphone and share don't all come at once yes well this morning was a good example of me being very thankful for the people here the things I've learned from all of them throughout the years, and I'm thinking specifically medically now. Uh, years ago, Dave Donahue, who's an op ophthalmologist, no, optometrist, optician, optometrist, who helped me um, decide about an eye operation I was very scared of. And I listened to him, and it changed my life, my, my glaucoma. And I think now of our resident doctor, John Driesen, uh, as I'm now having issues again with my Achilles tendon, it won't heal. And I'm just so thankful that we have all these people with different expertise levels that can help me to easily explain things. So I really appreciate John and all his help and everyone else who's helped me throughout the years with things that I have learned from you that I didn't know before. Thanks. Thank you.
So, uh, I am Dr. John. Uh, and I was well versed, I was well prepared to play my part in the little presentation. I was well trained for that. Um, actually, my joy is we're ending uh, the festival of Hanukkah as the kind of the wandering Jew from the past. I'm going to start out like the flame. It brought that memory back of days past. We lit all the candles sequentially. And uh, you know, let us not forget the message of Hanukkah. There's so many messages, you know, the faith in the oil, the belief in better things to come, the fact that small numbers of people can make a huge difference uh, when they're motivated strongly for their, for, their, for their cause. So let us remember the message uh, the fulfillments of Hanukkah. Thank you, John. And our closing hymn today will be in recognition of Hanukkah. I'm Albert Kessler, we hear no evening. I have a particular joy today <clears throat> wandering through the uh, YouTube section of my computer. I came across a piece of music performed by my oldest grandson uh, playing his ukulele and singing a Hawaiian song. Uh, and he said it was, uh, according to the notes that he sent along, was uh, composed by a, uh, a Haole, a non-Hawaiian performer in uh, like 1927. And it's, uh, the name of the song was Haole Hula. It was uh, interesting to hear. I'm uh, delighted to see his, his uh, music is no worse than before. And uh, the, uh, the song, an interesting one, certainly. It's, uh, it was a song for Hawaii, not just for Hawaiians, but for everyone who appreciates Hawaii. Let us remember to hold in our hearts the joys and sorrows of the whole company of humanity, whether they are spoken and shared or silent and solitary. Now let us join in a period of prayer and meditation in silence. Spirit of life, source of hope, God of many names and of none, if we could bring about miraculous transformations, this would become a world of peace, justice, love, hope, and friendly climate, where nation would no longer wage war against nation, where the young would no longer learn war, where parents would no longer give guns to their teenage children as Christmas presents, but where we would all be our swords in our plowshares and our spears in the pruning hooks, where we would love Mother Earth not just with our words but with our actions, by the way we live our lives, so that, so that our grandchildren's grandchildren will live in a friendly will be appreciative of their 21st century ancestors. We pause in silence for individual contemplation. Pause in silence to listen to the voice that speaks without words. We pause in silence to feel the love that's in this place.
by the Reverend Lowell Grisham, rector of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Fayetteville, Arkansas. He was our friend and colleague during our five years in Fayetteville. He writes, it bugs me when preachers or politicians quote the Bible and act as if that closes the debate. Quote the Bible is to enter into the debate, to take part in a conversation that spans centuries. For the good of tongue in cheek, I've said that the Bible is something like a Rorschach test. Historically, people have found biblical proof texts to defend nearly everything our imaginations can conjure including slavery and genocide, communism and pacifism. There are some important major themes that resound constantly, consistently throughout the scriptural tradition. Care for the poor and justice for the weak. Trust in God rather than in your own power. But part of the richness of the Bible is that it preserves centuries of debate and conversation among God's people about their conflicting interpretations concerning how we should live. The greatest violence ever visited on Holy Writ is the conceit that the Bible is only one voice, as if it were dictated by God as its single author. The second reading is from the Reverend John Buren's book, Understanding the Bible, an introduction for skeptics, seekers, and religious liberals. John Buren is a past president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Massive injustice has been and continues to be done in the name of the Bible. We've allowed the powers and principalities of both secular and spiritual oppression to usurp the spirit of the Bible and use it to legitimize such clear sins as economic and environmental exploitation, racism, sexism, homophobia, and more. Meanwhile, the Bible is also about the beauty and goodness of creation itself about the ancient human struggle for freedom and liberation, about frustration with violence and injustice throughout the generations, and about experiences of exaltation, expectation, and inspiration that can sustain the human quest for wisdom, justice, and peace. Carly, another hymn, please. you're a teacher and you inflict them on your students. You walk into class expecting a discussion of the homework or a lecture, or perhaps you're hoping for a substitute teacher or a fire drill, but instead just as the bell stops ringing, the teacher announces, this morning let's start with a short quiz. Please put all your books on the floor and take out a clean piece of paper. Thank God you don't have to worry about pop quizzes in church. But Wait a minute, wouldn't that be a good way to start a sermon on the Bible? Find out how much we already know. You won't need paper for this, we'll do it by a show of hands. This is multiple choice. Here's the first question. Who performed Adam and Eve's wedding? Was it A, God, B, Adam and Eve are Quakers, they did, not, they did the ceremony themselves, or C, they had their children out of wedlock. I don't see any hands. There's a hand. Another hand. Here's the second question. What was the name of Noah's wife? Was it A, Harriet, B, Joan, C, Mrs. Noah? No take. Ah, there's one. I kind of like Joan of Arc myself. Here's your last question. According to the genealogy found in the Gospel, according to Matthew, which of the following were among the ancestors of Jesus? 
A, a prostitute, that would be Rahab. B, an adulterer, yes. David was an adulterer also. He was a polygamist, possibly bisexual. C, the child of an incestuous relationship. Yes, that would be Perez. See Genesis chapter 38. D, all of the above. Yeah, that's the right answer, all of the above. Okay, there are three <coughs> basic big questions with respect to the Bible. And this is no longer a pop quiz. If I've missed others, please let me know. First, is the Bible the word of God? Second, is the Bible without error? Third, does the Bible tell us how we should live? You might notice that the first two questions are related. If the Bible is the word of God, presumably it is without error, since God knows everything, and God wouldn't lie to us. Or if you start with the second question, if the Bible is without error, then it must be the word of God, for how else could it have avoided error? The question that arises if you're trying to answer the inerrancy question is whether the Bible should be read literally, from cover to cover, or whether some parts of it can be understood <coughs> metaphorically. Now, I could go on with the discussion of the big questions, but I'm afraid I'd lose half of you. Indeed, I may have lost half of you already, or more than that. So here's what I'm going to do instead. It seems to me that it's much more helpful to consider particular stories or passages within the Bible, to start with the Bible itself, rather than to start with theories about the Bible. Indeed, I don't understand how anyone could have an informed view of the three big questions who had not spent quite a bit of time studying the Bible itself. So let's take a look at what is actually in the Bible, a very small sample of the whole, and I confess, not a random sample. Let's start in Genesis with Abraham. Abraham, you'll recall, is the man chosen by God with his wife Sarah to start the great nation that will later be known as Israel. Abraham is the first patriarch. One day, Abraham and God are chatting, and God decides that he really has to share with Abraham his plans for Sodom. This is from Genesis chapter 18. A, God begins. Abe, I've decided to wipe out the city of Sodom just to wipe it clean off the face of the earth. Their sin is just too grave. The outcry against them is too great. Note that God does not mention what Sodom's sin is, nor does God appear to have followed any kind of procedural due process. God is simply responding to the outcry that God has heard. Abraham senses that there's a problem here. Well, sir, he says, this comes as quite a shock to me. One of my favorite restaurants is in Sodom. But suppose, just suppose that there are 50 righteous men in Sodom. Would you still wipe it away? God considers Abraham's question for a minute, then responds, Okay, Abe, if I find 50 righteous men in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham is encouraged by God's response. But he's also somewhat amazed by it. He had assumed that God was someone who would always stick to his guns. Someone who got it right the first time, and therefore should never budge. Abraham knew that he could be getting into dangerous territory, but he could not help but dig a little deeper. What if there were only 45 righteous men? What if five of the 50 were missing? Would, would you still wipe Sodom away? God was not at all pleased with where he feared this conversation was headed, but he felt that only one response was possible. Okay. If I find 45 righteous men, I'll spare the city. Abraham was getting nervous. He had heard that God had quite a temper, so he felt compelled to continue. What about 40? Okay, I'll spare them. 30? Okay. 20? Okay. 10? All right, shouted God. If I find 10 righteous men, I'll spare the whole planet the city. Actually, God used some words here that I cannot repeat from the pulpit. With that, Abraham lost his nerve, and in due course, Sodom was destroyed. 
but we are never told what their great sin was. Let's move ahead now to the time of Moses. It is Moses, Moses you will recall, who leads God's chosen people out of slavery in Egypt and sets them on the path toward the promised land. Moses spends a fair amount of time on Mount Sinai talking to God one on one. On one occasion, this is from Exodus chapter 32, just after God has given Moses the stone tablets on which God has written instructions for the Israelites, God, God noticed something disturbing. Moses, God said, Moses, look down there where your people are camped. What do you see? My eyesight isn't as good as yours, sir. It looks like they've gathered around a campfire. Moses, God continued, you better look again. That stiff-necked gang of ne'er-do-wells have made themselves a golden calf. My goodness, sir, Moses responded. I wonder where they found the gold. Doesn't matter where they got that gold, God shouted. They're worshiping a golden calf and making sacrifices to it. And one idiot just said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Don't they know that as far as they're concerned, I'm their one and only God? Sorry, sir, I thought they understood. Well, don't just stand there, God continued. Go down there at once and let them know who's boss. Yes, sir, I'll head right back down the mountain. No, no, wait, God said. I've got a better idea. Just let me alone so my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them. But don't worry, of you I will make a great nation. But Moses was very worried. Sir, with all respect, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Think what the Egyptians will say if they hear about this. He brought them out of Egypt just to kill them in the mountains. Turn from thy fierce wrath, change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants. How you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on the people. God changed God's mind. We've had now two examples of people challenging God, arguing with God, and persuading God to change what God was planning to do. God can be reasoned with, that's the good news. But God has a hot temper, and his conduct is unpredictable. And don't forget, God is in charge. This should make you a little nervous. I've done these two stories, Abraham bargaining with God about the fate of Sodom, and Moses persuading God to back off from his hasty plan to wipe out the Israelites. I've done these two stories to set the stage for a third one. With this one, we're back again to Abraham. Here's the scene. It's from Genesis chapter 22. Abraham and Sarah, despite their old age, now have a son, Isaac, the son who will be the ancestor of a great nation. At least that's what they've been led to believe. One day, God comes to visit Abraham again. Hello, Abe. I'm back again. It's me, God. At your service, sir. It is an honor to have you among us again. Hey, I've got a favor to ask of you. I hope you won't mind. Your wish is my command, sir. Just say the word. Take your son, Abe, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. No problem, sir. Consider it done. Hello, Abraham. Earth to Abraham. Do you know what you just agreed to do? Do you know how burnt offerings work? First, you take a knife sharp knife and slay the creature to be sacrificed. And then you light a fire under the corpse and burn it. You just agreed to murder your son. Well, yes, but God told me to do it. Abraham, wake up. We don't do that to our children. We don't do that to our fellow human beings. But God told me to. Abraham, what about Sarah? You're going to kill your son without consulting with Sarah? What would be the point? God told me to do it. Abraham, for the love of God, for the love of humanity, how do you know that was God? Well, he said he was God, and he had a deep, godlike voice. Who else could it have been? 
Here we have what I consider one of the most disturbing stories in the Bible. God tells Abraham to kill his son, and Abraham agrees. This is the same Abraham who earlier bargained with God in an attempt to save the residents of Sodom. Now, as you probably know, at the last instant, God intervenes, and Isaac is spared. This is a test. This is only a test. Abraham has passed the test. But let's stop there. Did Abraham really pass the test? Here's how I'd like to understand the story. God is testing Abraham, yes. But testing Abraham to see if Abraham has a moral sense, to see if Abraham can tell right from wrong, to see if Abraham is willing to stand up to illegitimate authority. Abraham has flunked the test. That makes God very sad. What shall become of humanity of my beloved humanity, God says to himself, if they are willing to kill each other, if they are even willing to sacrifice their own children. And God remains sad to this day as we humans continue to kill each other, as we continue to sacrifice our own children. Here's another story from the Bible. Let me warn you that the two principal themes in the Bible are sex and violence. In this story, we have both. It's R-rated at best. This is from 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12. This is a story about King David. David is Israel's greatest king, a leader without equal. This is the same David who had the encounter with Goliath. In springtime, the time of year when kings wage war, David's army is off fighting the Ammonites. But David has stayed home. One afternoon, he's up on the roof of his palace. Roofs were flat in ancient Israel. It was cooler there than inside. He's up on the roof, and what does he see but a young woman, a beautiful young woman, taking a bath on the roof of a neighboring house. David is the king, so he has no difficulty summoning her to the palace. Her name, he learned, is Bathsheba, and her husband, Uriah the Hittite, is off with David's army. I'll spare you the details, but in due course, the Bathsheba sends the king a message. I'm pregnant. Oh, father, says David to himself, wait till my wife hears about this. So he summons Uriah, that's her husband, back from the battlefield, debriefs him about how the war is going, then casually suggests that Uriah should go home and spend some time with his wife. But Uriah is faithful to his duty and to his comrades. He doesn't go to his own house, but sleeps in the servants' quarters at the palace. The next day, David asked, asked him why he didn't go home to his wife. Sir, how can you suggest such a thing, sir? Uriah responds. My leader and my fellow soldiers, they're all encamped in the open fields far from their wives and families. They don't have enough to eat. They're suffering either from heat or rain or both. They could get killed at any minute. There's no way I could go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife. It would be wrong. As thou livest, as thou soul livest, I will do no such thing. So on the second night, David tries to get Uriah drunk, but not too drunk. But again, Uriah stays at the palace and doesn't go near his wife. Finally, David sends Uriah back to the army camp, but with a sealed message to his general. Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting, then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. In due course, Uriah is killed, and David marries Bathsheba. Did I mention that David already had a wife? Not a problem. Already had several wives. But here's the heart of the story. The prophet Nathan comes to visit the king. Actually, God sends him. And Nathan tells David a story. There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat of his meager fare, and drink from his cup, and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man. The rules of hospitality required that the rich man feed the traveler, but he was loath to take one from his own flock to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. So instead, he took the poor man's lamb and had his servants prepare that for the guest. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. 
As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And Nathan looked straight at David. You are that man. Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel. Nathan has it just right, doesn't he? The rich man, the person of power and privilege, he should not take his poor neighbor's little lamb. Likewise, the king should not take his poor neighbor's wife. Can't argue with that. This is a story, the story of David, Bathsheba, and Nathan. This is a story that many in our society need to hear and to take to heart. But there are two things about the story that I find most remarkable. First, the prophet Nathan lived after rebuking the king. He might have been executed on the spot. And secondly, this story made it into the Bible. It makes the great King David look pretty bad. You can hardly have a sermon about the Bible, the Bible of our Unitarian and Universalist forebears, without mentioning Jesus. Can I summarize Jesus for you in the next three minutes? Not hardly. But let me share with you a few passages that I believe are key in our search for the message of Jesus. First, here's part of what Mary says about God while she's pregnant, realizing that God has made her special. This is from Luke chapter 1. He has shown strength with the with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Here next are the words of Jesus early in his career when he returned to Nazareth, his hometown, and he's speaking in the synagogue on the Sabbath. This is from Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The year of the Lord's favor, by the way, is the jubilee year when debts are forgiven. Finally, here's what Jesus wants to be able to say to all of us. This is from Matthew chapter 25. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Just as you did this for one of the least of those who are members of the human family, you did it for me. In short, Jesus is in favor of the poor and the oppressed and distrustful of the rich and the powerful. In case you were wondering what Jesus says about same-sex marriage, he didn't. He was silent on that topic. But what do you think he would say? So here's my view of the Bible. If you were going to a desert island and could take only one book with me, I might well choose the Bible. Not because I believe it to be the Word of God or somehow inspired by God, but because it is such a human book. The stories over more than a thousand years of how fallible humans limited, just as we are, to their time and place. How they dealt with religious, political, and moral issues how they dealt with what it means to be human. So let's take the Bible seriously. Let's engage with its stories in open minds and an open heart. Let's be ready to listen to the voice of God, but let us also be ready to argue back. Amen. And now in recognition of Hanukkah, Carly will play hymn 223, Rock of Ages. Let our song praise your saving power. contentment and challenge. 
May we live in a world of peace and justice. May your life be a testament to your faith and a blessing to the world. May the love of this community sustain you until we meet again in all the days of your life.